I said, as, this is the semicha pro- process. After the rabbi identified a student with all the qualities, with all the knowledge, the dedication, the humanity, the understanding, the rabbi says, you know what? I would like you to go and be practically to work with people. For that, you need to know a couple of other things that you didn't learn, which is the laws of Shabbat, the laws of Kashrut, the laws of Nida, more in detail, and the laws of Avelut, maybe. So that was done. So those tests on Shabbat, Kashrut, Nida were the Makebe Patish, it was the final touch. After you've studied for years and you knew what you needed to know, then you had to do those extra things and become a rabbi. Today, because we are, you know, we live in the post-industrial revolution uh, world, everything goes, you know, follows the, you know, we have to have a certain norm, everything has to be quantified, everything has to be measured, standard testing, etc. So you needed to create a standard system to graduate rabbis. What is the standard system? Kashrut Shabbat Nida. What about all the rest? The ability to communicate with people, to study Tanakh, to be a humane person. We don't care about that. We just need a stamp. And that's that's what we're missing. And that's when, when someone asks me, what do I need to what do I need in order to become a rabbi or Tamid Hacham? I say, first thing you need to know, beside being a, a human being, right? Of course, a good human being, you need to know Tanakh. You need to know Tanakh in and out. You have to, under, whenever, why is that? Because when they ask you a question about Shabbat, you have to have in your mind, okay, what was Shabbat like in the time of the Torah? What was it like in the time of the Nevi'im? What was it like in the time of the Ketuvim? Was there ever a development? Now I know the, the balance and the, and, and the proportion of what, what, how, what is the importance of Shabbat in Halakha. Same thing with business ethics. Everything that you want to learn, you want to examine through the, the first through the lenses of, of Tanakh. And that, unfortunately, is a book that the Haredi world has completely rejected. The, especially the Ashkenazi world. The Ashkenazi Orthodox world has rejected Tanakh. The first time that I learned that, and I was shocked, is when I came from my uh, right, my school, it was which is like a modern yeshiva school in Yerushalayim, beautiful school. Uh, and I also participated in Hidola Tanakh. So for us, Tanakh was like number one. I come to the yeshiva and all the rabbis, even the Sephardic rabbis who were trained in Ashkenazi yeshivot, didn't know Tanakh well enough. Even sometimes it came from the Torah. Very, very quickly they found out that I come from a household, you know, from a, from a family where Tanakh is number one. So like almost every Shabbat, the rabbi is, gives, gives a Dvar Torah, and he says, and this is what is written in the Pasuk. He starts the Pasuk, and then Ovadia, can you finish? Right? So I'm, the, I'm the, the database for them. That's not, if you can't finish a Pasuk from the Tanakh, that's, it's not good. Whether you know it in Hebrew or in English and Spanish, it doesn't matter. You have to know it. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is history. One cannot be a rabbi or a leader without a solid understanding of history, not only of what relates to what you have to do, but the history of the world in general, of society, because nothing happens in a vacuum. Everything has history. When we go to a doctor, the doctor asks about our medical history. When you buy a property, you want to know the history of the property. Who lived here? Why did the tenant move? Why did the owner sell it? Why is, it, why is the price law? When you want to conduct business, you, know that you want to know the history of your partner. But when you come to halakha, I don't need history. What does the latest book say? Yes, no, that's it. Why? That's our that's our big problem. Anyway, uh, so maybe you gotta you know carried uh, uh, awful, but this is really important. Halakha is the core of our life, and I've seen I can say also this that if I've seen people, most of the people that I've seen uh, falling off from halakha, falling away from being Jewish, it's not about theology, and it's not about the evolution or biblical criticism or anything else. It's about halakha. Someone who grew up religious and ends up not being religious is because halakha was administered to that person incorrectly. It was imposed on him. It was force-fed. It was done as a road without understanding. Uh, or people who became ba'alei teshuvah and say, halakha doesn't care about me. Halakha doesn't listen to me. And that's something that I want to change and working on. Bezot Hashem, uh, we'll get there. I've been working on it for the last... Uh, 
I think since I was a teenager, but the first time I, I tried to start a uh, rabbinical school, I was too young for that, was 25 years ago when I lived in Bogota and I, I started a kolel. But leat leat, we get there. So um, before I go to the parasha, it's very interesting. Uh, anyone has any question or comments on, on, on this? And you feel free. This is a shiur, so um, yeah. Okay. Any comments or questions about this? Yes, David. Uh, okay. Rabbi, this, this rabbinic school... Couple, Anyone wait, who has to leave, don't worry. I'm, yes. Just a couple of questions. Number one is, what is, what, what is the... Have you, have you determined the schedule, for example? Oh, no, that, that's different. That, for details about the school, uh, there's a... I put the... Um, um, I'll, I'll put now the, um, uh, the email. This is the... Uh, my colleague is taking care of it, and you can email and you get, and also the, the website is soon as going to be up, uh, the remote.org. So you can go to the website and see everything. But I'm saying, if, if you talk about, if you want to know about the halachic uh, concept and message that I would, I'd love to share. Um, meanwhile, let's go and look a little bit in the, in the parasha. We have two parashot this week, so we're not going to cover much, but whatever we, whatever we can, we'll do. So I'm going to the website of Mechon Mamre. That's my go-to when I want. Uh, it's mechonmamre.org. You see it here. Uh, that's my go-to when I want to use Tanakh in Hebrew English, even though the translation is a bit archaic. It's the old JPS from 1924. That's what they, would, uh, they were willing to release um, uh, free. So now we are on chapter 16. That's Parashat HaRemot. וידבר אדוני אל משה אחרמות שני בני אהרון בקרבתם לפני אדוני וימותו. So let's discuss this pasuk for a second. Actually, we don't even need to look at the pasuk. This is one concept that I need to talk about. Uh, I think that the, the, that concept of בני אהרון dying because they got too close, they brought אש זרה, is, is really mind-boggling, right? The Mefarshim say that they were drunk, that they did this, did that. Ibn Ezra says that they went into Kodesh HaKodashim. Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, rejects all these opinions. He says, if that was what happened, the Torah should have written it. The Torah never writes it, meaning this is not what happened. The Torah says very clearly that uh, they got close and they died. He said they just made one step out of line and they died. How can we understand that? Why such a, uh, a harsh punishment? Now, <clears throat> where, where this really comes into play is in the book of Bimidbar. The, it happened in Sefer Vayikra, but where the Torah uh, hones this point is Sefer Bimidbar. Sefer Bimidbar is very well structured, but unfortunately, people who you know, because of the name Bemidbar in the desert, uh, we're reading Parashat Haremot Kedoshim. This is the parasha. So I'm just saying in the beginning of the parasha, we speak about the death of Ben Aaron. If you look at Sefer Bemidbar, uh, first of all, the name is Bemidbar in the desert. Oh, okay. In English, it's called a Numbers. we like the book of, or the book of senses. Okay, so Numbers in the desert, not so interesting. Then you start reading the Humash, and it looks like a collection of stories. They went here, they went there, then the, then the, the spies, the Korah, um, Balak, Miriam spoke against Aaron. Just a, it looks like a diary that someone wrote entries as they go through the desert. There's no connection. But the truth is, there's a very deep connection. Uh, hopefully, we'll be out of, uh, uh, of quarantine when we get there, but we don't know that it happens. It isn't Shavuot. But I'll be glad to keep the, uh, the shiur going. But the Midbar is a very, very complex, and not actually not complex, very clear structure. It shows Am Yisrael before, the, before the, uh, the crisis, before the failure, and after the failure. God creates a program for them. He says, this is, if you want to have a perfect nation, a perfect society, this is what you do. And then uh, a trust crisis starts where people start questioning the leadership. They question Moshe, they question Aharon, 
Moshe questions God, the people question Moshe, then they fight among themselves and everything falls apart. Now, one of the key phrases in Sefer Bamidbar is Esh Zara, a foreign or alien fire, or the, the, the word Zar. Torah keeps repeating the word Zar and keeps repeating the story about uh, Nadav Avihu who died when they brought Esh Zara. Why is it so important to Sefer Bamidbar? Because Sefer Bamidbar shows us how a perfect society can fall apart when people don't understand boundaries. And that's only, that's one side of the coin that Sefer Bamidbar shows. There are two sides. One side is we're all equal. In Sefer Bamidbar, there's a census, everybody is counted, all the Nesi'im, each one brings a korban, day one, day two, day three, the same exact text for each and every Nasi. Why? To show that we're all equal. So equality is great. I'm a great believer in equality. When does equality become a problem? When people think that equality means that everyone can do anything. One of the reasons that the kibbutzim in Israel eventually fell apart is because they wanted everyone to do everything. You're the secretary one day, the next day you work with the cows, the next day you work in the field. Nobody can uh, develop an expertise in his field. And sometimes people who are not knowledgeable do things that are wrong <clears throat> or they're not dedicated enough. But that's a very general example. When we think about a democracy, right, like the United States, we understand that though everybody should have equal rights to vote or to be represented, not everybody could take upon himself every role. You know, an interesting example is uh, the way presidents appoint people for cabinets, right? Both on both sides of the aisle, I'm not being political. Every president appoints some people to some cabinets, not based on qualifications, but based on connections, or especially to become ambassadors. It's all over the world. There's one agency, one agency, that always gets a director or someone in charge who's an expert in the field. They never give it to uh, someone based on nepotism or being related to or anything like that. You know which agency is it? Aviation. And why is that? Because the government officials also have to be on the planes. So they want experts there so they don't die because they understand that it relates to them. In other words, the, as much as we are uh, shocked by what happens to Nadava Avihu, that could be an exaggeration of the Torah, we don't know exactly what happened, but what Torah is trying to say, that for a society to function correctly, there must be boundaries. We have to be flexible, we have to recognize equality, but we also have to understand that there are certain professions where we need people who are highly trained to do them. Rabbi. No, I have a friend actually. I don't have to imagine that, but yes, Michael, you want to say something? I want to, if it's okay with you, uh, can I add to what you just said about that example uh, of boundaries? Of course. Of course. So I, this is something that I've always tell people, you cannot ask the heart to do the work of the lungs. So if we look at creation and anything in a natural state, right? All the cells and everything have a, have, receive a, anyway, from, from as soon as you get a stem cell, okay, they're assigned a tafkid. And as soon as they're designated that tafkid, that, that, that assignment, they cannot change. You cannot take, you have muscle cells, you have bone cells. So I think, be, you know, I think it's the, like the best example to, to use the nature, the natural state that we know. You know, and I, I think that's like the best ba uh, boundary to describe this because, you know, Hashem, you know how they say Hashem created the world, you know, using the Torah and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So nature in any, in any, in any, you know, anything that we have in this world works within those laws that Hashem set in place for nature. And right. now so it's, actually, yeah, it's a good example because we talk about something that has the potential to develop to many different things, but once it develops and takes that shape, 
that's where it is. Uh, interesting to, to note on that, that Israeli scientists are working on uh, a cure for, uh, or, or a treatment for uh, Corona uh, with the placenta cells. They said that you yeah. can produce from one placenta enough medicine to treat 20,000 patients uh, because they're still, uh, the placenta cells are like stem cells, still uh, uh, they can be manipulated. But so going back, you know, to the world of medicine, uh, we would understand, all, everybody would understand that uh, you don't want the janitor who every day cleans the operation room, right, the OR, you don't want him there during surgery or definitely not performing the surgery. Even though he's the person who's there every day and knows all the ins and outs of that room, he should not be the surgeon. But more than that, when you do a surgery, you want someone who is a specialized surgeon in what the patient uh, needs to do the surgery. I have a, uh, a friend, actually, uh, my sister's boyfriend um, is a paraplegic. It was a very athletic man, it was a, 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 but he had a back injury. And when he, got, when he got into the hospital, the doctor who operated on him was not a back surgeon, it was an orthopedic surgeon who left him paraplegic. So if we think about it in that, in that uh, through that perspective, we understand that this is a symbolic act in the uh, foundation of the Mishkan. The Kohanim are the leaders, spiritual leaders. They are going to, to show the people what to do and how to follow. And if they break the laws and if they break boundaries, that, I mean, that's, I'm not saying that we understand how uh, God punished them or if it is a punishment and why is our own suffering justified. But I'm saying that when this is taken to, uh, to an extreme, the whole nation will suffer when boundaries are crossed. So we go back to the text, uh, to the parasha, and we see another interesting thing. And that is, uh, I'm just highlighting points, but not pasuk by pasuk. And we, then we get to this, this uh, very, very interesting text, <clears throat> which we read not only in the Torah, also in Yom Kippur, Seder Avodah, um, and that is the story of the two goats, the he goats, that one of them is sacrificed, and the other one is called Hasair Asher Ala Ala Vagoral Laazazel, Yaomad Hai Lifnei Adonai, Lechaper Alav, Leshalach Hoto Laazazel Barah. The goat which on which the lot for Azazel fell will be put alive before God and then it will be sent to Azazel to the Midbar. Okay, again, we don't need much of the Pasuk. Let me ask you, what happens to this goat that goes to the desert? Everybody, anybody knows? Sorry, this. What? Yes, thrown off a mountain? Yeah, it's thrown off a cliff. It's a very strange story. Always bothered me that... <clears throat> To me, what was described almost like a you know pagan ritual, the the kohen would take a thread of red uh, wool, crimson wool, and tie it. Uh, one part he would tie it to the horns of the of the goat, and the other side, the other part would be tied to the doors of the of the azara of the temple. And then they would walk that goat on a bridge. You see, I see that uh, we have here, uh, Albert has the back picture of the Kotel, good. So from this Kotel, if you saw the Robinson's Ark, you know, there's like a little half arc, the arch that goes out, it was actually a bridge that led uh, above, hi Albert, above the old city uh, into the mountains. And according to the Mishnah, the reason they built the bridge was to enable the Kohen <clears throat> who took the, the Sa'ir out to enable him together easily, because when he, if he would walk on the plain level, uh, on the street level, people would pull his hair and would tell him, go faster, go faster, because they believed that the goat carries on it all of their sins, and when he takes the goat to the desert and kicks, kicks it off the cliff, all the sins will disappear, so they uh, so they built a bridge, so that so we have like a you know safe pa pathway into the desert. So he gets to the desert and he goes up to a, a high cliff, and he pushes the poor goat. I mean, not that I mean, okay, we can't pretend to be too merciful. We there were a lot of uh, animals slaughtered in the temple, 
but at least it was done in what we think is a human way, uh, fast and uh, well, without a lot of suffering. But to push an animal from the top of the mountain and let it roll until all the, you know, its bone break the way it is described. The, the goal would make it to have the mountain uh, until it become uh, dismembered and oh, this is crazy. So uh, I, I came up with, a, by the way, there's a, th that story of the Sahil Azazel became a, um, a reason for a major dispute between uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Ahman, Ramban, and Rabbi Avram ben Ezra. Rabbi Avram ben Ezra wrote the commentary. He said, there's a, there's a deep secret here which I cannot reveal. And Ramban mocks him. He says, oh, he's a secret, secretive man. He, uh, but I'm a, I'm a gossiper. I'm going to tell you the secret. And uh, they go into... Uh, Another pasuk where it says, They should not bring sacrifices to the goats of the desert, whatever. I think there's a different interpretation here. Uh, and like Shai says, This is not the right way to treat animals. So I think there's a, there's a different interpretation here. That's my, uh, that's my theory. And I want to share it with you. And actually, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I came up with this, uh, with this theory. And it was actually, it, it started... <clears throat> with reading a pasuk in our in this week's parasha, what we just read on Shabbat, and uh, that's the story of the Mesorah. So in in chapter fourteen, we read this. Uh, where is that? No, not this. Uh, here, uh, chapter fourteen, verse four. It says, "Vetziva Kohen velakah la mitaher." We should take two birds and some other ingredients. He slaughters one of the birds over water and then he dips the living bird in the blood of the dead bird. And he will send, let free the living bird upon the field. And I think that those two stories, the bird of the leper that is being sent free and the, the he goat that is being sent on Yom Kippur are related. Any idea, anyone can tell me like well, how, are, how are they related? Any thought? It's not a test. I mean, you're, you're not enrolled in the program yet, so don't worry. Maybe because both of them is lechaper. Um, yeah, both of them right. In both of them, we have the word lechaper. So lechaper is a is a is a is a word that we understand as atonement uh, or expiate. Uh, but it was understand also lechaper is to clean, to wipe away. Why does it so? Uh, does it wipe away? Uh, there's one connection that the Torah suggests, right? But it's not. It's not full tahara, it's not impure, not purity. It's almost as something is still still lingers there, right? So uh, here's here's my thought. Okay. The traditionally it is a midrashic interpretation, but it has a lot of basis in the in the in the Torah from other places. That the the, the story of Metzorah is the story of someone who shuns other people. It could be someone who speaks the Shonara or who treats other people as lesser than him. Uh, and because when we see that from the way he's being treated, when he is Tameh, there are other people who are impure, but all they, all those other people have to sit outside the camp. The Metzorah is the only one who not only sits outside the camp, he has to say, Tameh, Tameh Yikra. When anyone gets close to him, he says, don't come near me, I am Tameh. If that is a person who used to speak Lashon Lara, then this situation is very poignant because he was the one who would point at others and say, you are Tameh, you are Tameh. And now he has to sit there and say, I am Tameh, I am Tameh. Right? It's a very painful uh, realization for him. So now he, a, a person who speaks Lashon Lara, now wants to become pure. He starts the process. 
He brings the two birds to the Kohen. The Kohen slaughters one like the traditional Korban. He takes the other and sends it free over the, to the field to symbolize what? To symbolize the sin of the leper. To symbolize the Shonara. Because even though you did the Shuvah, and now you come and you bring the Korbanot and everything, it cannot make up for the damage that already has been done. The birds was already sent out. There's a, a, another interesting uh, analogy in Tehillim, and it is of an arrow. In, uh, in Tehillim, the, the, the author says, Hetz shahut leshonam. Their, their tongue is like a sharp arrow. And why is it compared to arrow? First of all, because with arrow, you could hit someone from afar the way people could do with language. You say something here, it is even before the internet, it would eventually travel to the other side of the world. But the other uh, similarity is that once you shoot the arrow, you can't retrieve it. It's done. It, it is out already. So this is what happens with the Tzipore Metzorah. The message to the Metzorah is, it's true that you went through the suffering and you did the Shuvah and everything, but you know what is the best Shuvah for you? Next time, to not even do it at all. That always a message that I like to tell people on Yom Kippur. Instead of coming to the synagogue and crying and asking your friends for forgiveness, because that's what really you have to do, right? If you sin towards Hashem, Hashem can forgive you. It doesn't need you even to come to Shul. But you come to the Bet Knesset and, and you ask for forgiveness. You ask for forgiveness from one another. And uh, no, I see, I see the, the you know, uh, Adam, because you were, you were in that field also, right? Of uh, rabbinic leadership and Shana. I know them in Yosef. Uh, the people are, I know who are in the rabbinic, but other also. I see you, uh, you know, nodding with understanding. I'll share next year. I think, Ben, you heard it from me in Shul on Yom Kippur, but I, have, I want to share this story. Uh, one Yom Kippur, I went up. There's a, there's a tradition in the Sephardic community that on before Kol Nidre or after Kol Nidre, you say, Rabotai please forgive each other. And everybody says, we forgive each other and everybody's happy, right? And I don't know, I don't feel that it's real. I mean, it's a good reminder, but I don't know if it's real, right? So I asked before the Kol Nidre uh, uh, sermon, I said, is there anyone here in the shul who ever offended or wronged someone else and failed to ask for forgiveness? Nothing, nothing, everybody, no, not one hand showed. <clears throat> and then I asked, is there anyone here in shul who was offended by someone else, wronged by someone else, and that person never came to him and asked for forgiveness? And have the synagogue, you know, shut their hands up. And I told them that this is a miracle, that all the offenders went to another synagogue, and all the offendees came to my shul. How did this happen? <laughs> so, every year we come back, you know, and sometimes you can see with families, family members sit next to each other. They don't talk to each other the whole year. But you know, they come and sit, right? They go home and they say to each other, well, I hate you. So what, what have you done, right? So the real Teshuvah on Yom Kippur is not to come and say, I, forgive me, but to make sure it never happens again. And I think that's the idea of the, of the Sa'ir. The Sa'ir, I think, according to the Pshat, the way Ramban says in several places, the Midrash is Midrash, Halakha is Halakha. But what is the Pshat? What does the Torah tell us? If you read the Psukim Pshat as they are written, look what the Torah says. The Torah says nothing about killing the goat. Look what the Torah says. It says this. Ya'omad hai lifne Adonai lechaper alav leshalach oto la'azazel hamidbara. You send him to a land called Azazel because it's a desolate land. V'natan otam al rosh ha-sa'ir v'shilach b'yad ish'iti ha-midbara. He puts it on the head of the sa'ir and he sends him to the wilderness. You take the sins, you send them to the wilderness, right? And then... It says, uh, and he will send him free in the desert. What happens to the Avonot? What happens to the sins that that goat carries with him? They spread all over now. And maybe that 
he goat will find a she goat and will get married and they will have a nice family and the sins will keep multiplying. I think that was the message to Am Yisrael. On Yom Kippur, it says we have just like the Mitzvah, we have two equal. One is slaughtered, one is sent away. To tell them you only solved one of the problems. Oh, Tashlich, Sheina, this is such a. Tashlich, tashlich came about 400 years ago. <laughs> and that's why people are so obsessed with it. Oh, let's get rid of all my sins. It doesn't happen that way, right? Uh, but uh, the. And that's interesting also. Why, the, why was the Sa'ir chosen? You know? Because. Uh, it's in, in, it has a mythical di- dimension. There are a lot of evil gods that, uh, or you know, the pan in Greek mythology, the devil uh, has uh, you know hoofs of a, of a goat. Uh, in Spanish, the word that is related to cabra or cabron, you know, is not a good. It's not a good word. It's either evil or demented or 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 you know other other uh, other bad words. Uh, and why is that? Because of all the animals. Uh, the, if you ever did, anyone ever looked a goat in the face? You look at pictures. It's scary. It's very human. It's very human. So that is sort of like the 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 message of the Torah is here. Someone like almost human like you, all your sins are going now to the desert. This is, I think, a very uh, uh, potent uh, process of teshuva. Uh, but unfortunately, I think I don't know if uh, if the halacha was like that from the very beginning. Uh, but this is uh, something I think uh, that we should th- at least think about at the, at the pshat level as we read the story of the Seirim. Um And uh, I mean, right after that, it says, "Okay, one more thing, one more concept that is in this parasha, <clears throat> which is very interesting." One second, I see. Oh, I lost the chat. Uh, you can, by the way, you could you could ask me. You don't need to, to if if you're comfortable with the question. No need to send it by chat. For some reason, I don't see it. All right. Um, I was wondering, this is a beautiful symbology here that comes from the Torah and understanding the yeah. symbol makes it a much more, it makes it a very beautiful ceremony. So I'm wondering why or how did it evolve the rabbis and made it to shoving the goat down the mountain and all these other, you know, these other things that came along with it in the Mishnah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, so, you know, the, the, Staunch believer in everything will tell you this is the Torah of Moshe Misinai. That's how they did it. I don't know. It could be like what Shaina said before, and now she's adding because forgiving is the most difficult. This is like sort of uh, you know allows you to get rid of it without thinking about it. It's a better process. Um, think about, for example, the indulgences that the church used to sell in medieval times. You could you could pay money, get an indulgence, which said uh, this document gives you free access to heaven, right? So you don't need to do anything, just give money. I mean, it still happens with many religious institutions, Jewish, non-Jewish, all over. Anyway, but at least as I said, you know, anyway, we don't have the ceremony itself. It's good to have that in mind when we read uh, the story of Yom Kippur. So one last thing that is really, oh, again, sort of a, maybe a little different in the parasha that we're used to. Uh, it speaks about eating blood, not eating blood. And here in verse 13 it says, And whatsoever men there be of the children of Israel who will hunt a beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall pour out the blood and cover it with dust. Okay. From this Pasuk, there's a uh, ample halachic discussion of what is called kisui adam. You have to cover the blood. If you ever went to do kaparot, you saw that the, the, the shohet has a bucket of, uh, of dust. He slaughters the chicken in it and keeps covering. You have to cover the blood. And if you uh, slaughter venison, game, and not, uh, you know, not uh, uh, beef or, or lamb, you have to also... Uh, cover the blood, but not that you uh, slaughter domesticated animals. Why is that? There's no, I didn't find a clear answer in the Mepharshim. Why is that that you don't cover the blood of domesticated animals and you do of wild animals? Why is there a mitzvah to, it says he shall pour his blood, the way it's like you have to pour it on the ground and then cover it with dust. So this is also my interpretation. It could have maybe 
maybe it was uh, uh, influenced by, by the, the time when I was a vegetarian. I, for a while, maybe four years, take or, you know, give or take, I was a vegetarian. Uh, I'm not now, because, for the very simple reason that my wife is Moroccan. It's very, very difficult to be a vegetarian when your wife is Moroccan. Uh, because simply like, what am I going to cook? Even though I'm cooking also, you know, but still. Anyway, the long story, but here's my interpretation. This is what I think happens. First of all, it really should bother us. The Torah speaks about people hunting, right? No question, nobody raises a question when you read the Pasuk about hunting an animal. What should be your immediate question? How do you hunt an animal? You can't check. How do you hunt an animal? It's kosher, right? How is it kosher? Shehita, right? So how do you do shehita when you hunt? So only way to do shehita while hunting is by putting nets, not traps, because if you put a trap, you break the animal's legs. We must tell you that in the desert, traps don't work, nets don't work that well. The only way that you could trap animals with, with, with nets is if you have enough trees around you to encircle an area or to put hanging traps. It's very difficult to do that. My theory is this, that uh, in, at least at that period, it was allowed to kill animals with arrows, but it was not recommended. Maybe they did shahita after they hit the animal with an arrow. It's a possibility. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. There's a long discussion of to look at the, the laws of shahita and Tanakh could have been involved after the, the building of the temple. But here's my thought of why do you have to cover the blood? The, because the translation here is wrong. The translation here that I read, dash, like the separate here with the comma, if someone hunts a beast, uh, an animal or fowl, he shall pour out the blood and cover it. So uh, this is a description of what happens. And this is a description of what he has to do. If he hunts an animal, what he should do is cover the blood with dust. But it should be read differently. Here, that's before these two words. That's where we have to put the comma. Ish, ish, mibne. Let me actually see the tikkun. Where is my tikkun? So Still not approved. Could be that the mesola changed after uh, the practice changed. But let me see what it says here in, in the tikkun. Parashat by Remot. No, okay. It's, there, is a, there is a pause after Veshafach Edamo. This is how we should read it. If you hunted, if you killed a wild animal or a bird and you spilled, you spilled its blood, you have to cover it with dust. In other words, the, what, what, uh, that combination of words, Lechasot Be'afar, to cover blood, what does it really usually mean in the Torah or in the Tanakh? Or even in modern language, to cover, to cover the blood. What does it mean? What, what, is, what is the connotation of covering the blood? Kvora? What? Kvora, le kvor, mashu? Could be burial, or? Well, there's a the forgiveness <laughs> aspect, too. Well. Could yeah. be forgiveness. What else? Hiding it. For what? It says a damu anafesh. The blood is the soul. So what, let's go with Shana. Shana, you said you said there's a forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? I don't know. May, I, that just came to my mind when we thought of blood covering. Maybe that's actually a Christian connotation. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's a biblical connotation. Where is the first? Where is the first incident? If someone oh, maybe forgive me for the hunting. <laughs> This is uh, this is Kain and, and Havel. The first murder. God curses the earth for covering the blood of heaven. So we're really talking about murder. What the Torah tells us is you're allowed to kill domesticated animals that you raise 
and that you think, you know, also from the economic point of view, what can you afford? And don't wander into nature and take whatever you want. So when you, when you go out and you do said haya or off, because people didn't have domesticated birds in antiquity. The chickens came much later, not in biblical times. You never find the word chicken in Tanakh. Uh, so when you go out and you hunt an animal, the Torah says, this is a crime. You have to cover the blood. You have to feel like a murderer, right? It reminds me of a scene of one of the, I think the greatest movies, uh, not ever made, I can't, you know, I'm not a movie critic, but one of my, I think a very powerful movie, Avatar. Have anyone watched Avatar? It's an unbelievable movie. I just watched it again because of the, uh, you know, being quarantined, I, you needed something long to watch uh, over Hola Moed. I watch it again. There's a beautiful scene in the beginning when the avatar of that um, ex-marine is in the forest and is being attacked by an animal and the native uh, woman kills the animal and is happy and is clapping and says, she says, this is, should not have happened. And she kneels by the, by the dead animal and she sort of like performs a ritual of asking for forgiveness. So people think, oh, this is a primitive society. Not primitive. This is what the Torah says. I saw that and I thought of what the Torah says here. And I think it also, unfortunately, uh, we, we, we evolved <laughs> into a society that where most of us do not hunt, but we became worse than hunters because we grow beef, cattle, sheep, pigs, you know, for those who eat pork in, in quantities that are unsustainable for the planet. We became the hunters par excellence because this, that, we, we can have it at all, at all times. Uh, so if you hunted a little, uh, no, King David, I don't think it was a hunter. David speaks about um, uh, fighting off animals. He fought with the lions and the bears because they came to attack his sheep. I don't think that they were hunters. Uh, Didn't it say that he was out hunting when he met with, with Yonatan or something? I'm, I don't remember for sure. No, no, I don't think that they were hunting. No. Uh, uh, that is, uh, let me look one second here. It's the Aftara of, uh, of Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh, of Machach Chodesh. So it happens to be here. I don't have Tanakh next to me, even though I have it on the screen. But uh, where is it? I'll tell you. It's not. But in any case, we don't have, we don't, they didn't have it like, uh, you know, uh, a regular pastime as other cultures. If you look at the Assyrian kings, uh, uh, the Egyptians, they're always, they always described in, the, in hunting expeditions, um, but not, no, 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 they speak about uh, marksmanship. They go shooting arrows, but for marksmanship. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yes, thank, uh, I just wanted to make sure. So maybe I right, the, the American Indians uh, also. Israel, your, your voice is breaking. You want to send it by chat, it will be easier because the reception is not good. Rabbi, how do you equate what you just said to the pasuk that says, eat as much meat as your heart desires or your soul desires after, after the flood? Okay, good question. I'll conclude with that, okay? Because I, I want to keep it within the boundaries of time, more or less. Very, very good question of David. The Torah says, if you want to eat meat, you could eat meat as much as you can, right? Okay, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to go to the pasuk in Devarim, uh, wait, there's a, whoever talks with, there's an echo, I don't know who's speaking, but it uh, doesn't come out good. Okay, so in, I think it's chapter 16 or 15 in, uh, in Devarim, let's see where it is. Um, one second, 15 is a, or maybe before that, 13, I thought it was here. No, so it's 17. One second. Okay, let me, I, it's easier for me to look at it, look it up in the homage. I remember it's chapter 14. Uh, 14, 15, let's see. Uh, the Torah, oh no, it's, it's chapter 12, okay. It's chapter 12 of the, of the Varim. That's the one I didn't look up, okay. So let's see what the Torah says in chapter 12. Uh, and that's what uh, David was asking. Um, the Torah says here from verses 20 to 28, if you want to eat meat, 
right? Uh, because Hashem will uh, enlarge your border and you can eat meat and you will desire to eat meat. You can eat meat the way you desire. You can eat it the way people eat the gazelle and the heart and the deer. Just don't eat the, the blood. So it seems like the Torah says it's okay to eat meat. So, but let me read it to you in the, the way my mother, Alea Shalom, would, would answer us when we insisted of doing something. Let's say, for example, I wanted to go watch a movie, right? And I had homework to do. I wanted to go watch a movie with a friend. And she said, no, you can't. She says, but no, I really want to go. She says, you know what? You want to go? You want to go watch a movie? Go watch a movie. You really want it? Go do it. That's already the pasuk. If Hashem will expand your border and you will say, I would like to eat meat because you desire to eat meat, eat meat as much as you desire. Okay? Go ahead, eat meat. The problem is that we can't, we can't really get the full intonation of the Torah, but I feel that this paragraph, you can read it carefully, the Torah does not support the idea of eating meat regularly. So if you want, you could do it. And in reality, I did the research on that, both in biblical times and in the Talmudic times, people ate very little meat. It was a luxury. Only when you bring your sacrifices at the temple, you, you, there's a festive occasion. Uh, also, people did not slaughter their sheep or their cattle until they were almost dying because they always calculated the benefit that they will have from a living animal versus a dead animal. So it's not the way, the way we do today. I mean, if anyone from the past, Jewish, non-Jewish, observant, non-observant, would have traveled back in, you know, from, the future, from the past to our time and would go into a McDonald's and see that people eat in the morning a two-pounder, he would, he would completely flip out. Like, what are you doing, right? Total, yeah, total loco, right? Uh, I, I actually, on Shabbat, we went going around the block. We have a little shopping mall in the area, and it says the, the mall is closed, but McDonald's is still open. I said they could have written, why stay home and die slowly of coronavirus when you can come to McDonald's and be poisoned and killed on the spot, right? Uh, and, and this is, you know, uh, the, the danger really of, of eating, producing and eating meat in such quantities uh, and I'm looking at the screen. Okay, no, our, our carnivore in residence is not here. One of my good, my good friends. Uh, like one of the big dangers that I think most people are unaware is that uh, that uh, those animals are responsible for uh, greenhouse gases, the methane in the uh, in the atmosphere they, that is released uh, through their process is causing major, that's one problem. The other problem is avian flu and other, uh, and other diseases that, uh, tra- that, that uh, mutate from uh, animals to, uh, to humans. And the third problem, that only some of the problems, um, <clears throat> was discovered a couple of years ago, uh, not more than a couple, maybe 10, 10, 15 years ago, there were uh, major floodings in the, uh, uh, along the coast, on the East Coast, Southeast, the the Carolinas and Georgia, and uh, there are a lot of pig growers in the area, and the pig styes were washed into the sea. The bacteria in the excrement of the pigs killed all the fish in the area. Uh, Eduardo, do you remember that uh, story? You know uh, what I'm talking about. I've seen that. You've seen that. You've seen that. So we really are, we are destroying the planet with that. Then the Torah, I think, gave us the warning. So anyway, I don't want to leave you on a, on, a, uh, on a bad note, but I think that what the Torah gives us here is a glimpse, of all like three things that I, I highlighted that we take in one way and a completely different, different way to understand them. Uh, the, we're not sending the goats to be killed, but rather to tell us, you know, uh, how how to live our lives. We should not consume meat irresponsibly and, and constantly. Yes, David, grab an apple uh, for dinner. Uh, there's a, actually, there's a good book if you want to try to get off, uh, you know, to, to wean yourself off uh, of meat. It's called The China Study 
That's a book that I read the, the second time around when I became vegetarian, uh, very interesting. I, I recommend reading it. Uh, but I, the, the last thing I'm trying to, what, what was the first thing that I opened up with? Uh, uh, oh, why did they die? So I think it all, they are all applicable lessons to us today that we have to be responsible. We have to know our boundaries, what we can and cannot do. And that it's better to think of a deed before performing it and not regretting it uh, afterwards. Rabbi, uh, I think 